AI-powered software development from the trenches. Presented by Henrik Kneiberg. I'll just go sit down and let him talk, I think. Oh. Hi, everybody. Good to see you, although I barely see you because I have my reading glasses on, so you're all blurry, but I'm going to need to be able to read my screen. So. But I know you're out there. Hello. Um, so this, this AI thing, Jesus, it's like every second word I hear from anyone in the corridors, like blah, 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 AI. So, but yet here you are, listening to another AI talk. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of coding on this one, so uh, if you're not into that, you're going to be bored. <laughs> or maybe not. Sometimes it's fun to see how the sausage is made. Um, so uh, about one and a half years ago, one, one of my friends was telling me that, you know, this thing you're doing, coding, um, I think AI is going to soon be able to do what you're doing right now. And I was like smiling and nodding, like, yeah, right. Uh, I didn't really believe it at all. It just felt ridiculous. This thing I've been doing for like 30 years, no way an AI just can come along and do that. Couldn't even entertain the thought. Then, half a year later, GPT-4 shows up. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and it kind of changed everything for me. And now for the past year, I've pretty much been coding full-time with AI as my colleagues. So that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about today, what that kind of looks like. Um, ow, I just got a shock. Okay. Um, one thing I noticed during this kind of journey of changing the way I work entirely, because that's really what happened. I've really changed the way I work entirely with, with coding and also design. In fact, I think I've changed the way I think about product development. It's interesting. One thing I learned along the way was that there are, of course, limitations in these models, right? But it turned out that most of the limitations were not in the model. The limitations were here inside me. <laughs> So big aha, things, when I, whenever, when I got dumb code, it was usually because of a dumb prompt. <laughs> so that's a, a big aha, that the biggest constraint is me, what, learning what is possible to do and how you do it effectively. And it's a continuous learning journey, which I think many of us are in right now. Um, of course, the models also <laughs> do cause some limitations. Um, 3.5 was more like a toy, GPT-4 was actually a useful developing partner. So very, very big difference between different types of models. But one thing I I I'd like to just do a little bit of a shameless pitch. There's a lot of you know, buzz around AI and a lot of confusion. And a few weeks ago, I sat down and made a video called uh, Generative AI in a Nutshell. If you're confused by the whole thing and you don't want to go attend a whole day course or something, it's just 18 minutes, but it kind of gives you the big picture. So you can just find that on YouTube if, if you're curious about how it kind of all fits together. But, and it results in this big animated picture. For those of you who have seen my videos about the Spotify model and about agile product ownership, you'll recognize the style. But one thing I want to zoom into is that, that corner right there, uh, mindset. I've noticed that most people kind of tend to fall into different categories when it comes to how you look at generative AI. It usually starts over here to the left, like, nah, it can't do my job. That's where I was one and a half years ago, like, nah, of course not. Or companies who think they don't have time to look at this technology because they're too busy doing whatever they do. Then they look into it and they're like, oh my God. And then you might end up in the right corner, which is I'm screwed. <laughs> it's going to steal my job. My company's going to go bankrupt. And what I hope this talk is going to lead to is as many, of, uh, as many of you as possible, regardless of where you are on this scale, I hope to get you all more towards the middle, this feeling that, hey, this is a tool. And I, if I learn to use it, I'll be really productive. And that, that, that feels good, right? The time from idea to, to delivery becomes shorter. Plus, it also <laughs> increases your job prospects for the future, to be blunt. Um, so that's what, that's what I hope. Let's all move a little bit more toward, towards this mindset uh, in the middle. Now, the rest of this talk is going to be me sitting and coding and probably things blowing up right and left. So um, it's going to be quite informal. I'll be doing some coding, talking a little bit, sh um, sharing some thoughts. And the reason why I decided to do that was because working with AI as your colleague is weird and different. And I can't convey that in a slide, really. I'm curious though, how many here work kind of day-to-day -day with AI as your colleague? Like you couldn't work without it. It's kind of sitting there next to you all the time. Hand up. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm, I'm not alone. <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse. I feel kind of handicapped when I don't have my coding buddy next to me. It's like, it's interesting. But for the rest of you, uh, I hope you'll get some ideas and maybe some inspiration um, into this weird new world that we're moving into. So I'll start with a very simple example that those of you who are experienced will get really bored with that one. Then I'll get to some really advanced examples that those of you who are new will be very confused. But on average, hopefully it'll be interesting, right? So let's get the boring, simple example out, out of the way. Um, so let, let's say I want to do something really, really simple. I, I want to make a, 
you know, Swedish person numbers. They have a certain format, right? I want, I want to parse that. I need a function to parse that um, and figure out, is this valid? So how would we do that in traditional programming? Well, you would have, probably have to do, do some Googling, right? Uh, format of Swedish person number. So I'm not going to learn about that. And, and I'm actually going to use Python now because we've been doing Java all day, right? So I'm going to be mixing some Python, some JavaScript now. We'll not be doing Java. Um, uh, am I not sharing my screen? Oh, Jesus. Th thanks for telling me. That would have been funny if I did the whole talk and I'm just like, eh, talk. <laughs> right. Well, that would have been the joke on me, right? Okay. There we go, right? Format of Swedish person number. And I would Google that and try to figure it out. And then I might say uh, Python function, uh, function. Yeah, oh, wow, I typed this before, right? Yeah. So validate that, and I'll be like, okay, hmm, there's some kind of a repo here, some examples. I could probably cobble something together. But what if I, what if I want to, you know, I want to have some special requirements here. I want to uh, ignore the uh, checksum. For whatever reason, I don't care about that right now. And I, I want an adapted version of this. So I would Google it, and I would copy paste some stuff, and I, I would probably figure it out. But it might take, I don't know, half an hour of fiddling. Well, of course, nowadays, right, we have this, uh, this thing called ChatGPT, and of course, other models as well. And first of all, tip number one, never, ever, ever code with ChatGPT 3.5. All right, thank you. <laughs> it, it's a great toy, but not for serious use for coding. So I would say, I would probably just say that, right? Let, let's, let's copy what I, what, I, what I wrote there, uh, this one, right? There we go. Is this visible? But should I make it a bit bigger? Right. You'll have to give me feedback as we go, by the way, because I'll just be sitting here staring at my screen. Right. So, uh, okay. It'll tell me a little blah, blah, blah. Right. This is something you've all been doing, I think. How many of you have been doing stuff like this with GPT? I'm just curious. It's just about everybody. So this is old hat. This is old news, right? You ask a question, it'll explain a little bit, and, and hopefully at some point actually give me some code down here. And I would copy-paste that into, into my environment, right? And I would run it. So uh, why not let it finish here, and we'll do that. Um, and what, what's interesting here is now it's starting to make some assumptions, right? I can see it in the code. I can see it in the comments. I can see it up here. And this is an important part. The less I give it in the prompt, the more it's going to assume things. And that may be fine or might not. So it's kind of on you, right? You decide how much constraints do you want to give it. So I tend to write a short prompt and then just see what it gives me and then work with it from there. So let's actually try this, right? Um, uh, so let's go like this, and we'll go new file, pe. yes. This is tiny. Is that visible? Well, okay, good. <laughs> Some people are quiet, for them it's not visible. Um, so I'm going to run that, and um, it, true, false, true, true, false. Okay, kind of wrote like a little test case here. Okay, whatever. So if I'm, the next step might be to take that, right? Maybe make some changes, go back to ChatGPT, paste in my changes, let's pretend I made some changes, and then go uh, add some unit tests, right? And it gives me unit tests and I paste it back. So copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. It feels ridiculous, but it's incredibly effective when you learn it. <laughs> so this is what I was doing the first half year of coding with GPT. I was copy pasting like crazy and being surprised at how effective this weird thing was. However, I don't do that anymore. So goodbye copy paste, goodbye chat GPT. I'm gonna show the next thing. This looks like Visual Studio Code, right? I don't much like Visual Studio Code. I've been a, a JetBrains fanboy for many years. But then someone made, a group of people made like a, a fork of Visual Studio Code. And uh, um, it's called Cursor. So uh, um, I am not sponsored by Cursor, but I probably should be. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what is this? Well, it's basically Visual Studio Code plus this over here. So I'm gonna erase this file here. Right, and I'm gonna uh, add that prompt again. Um, so let's just copy what I wrote here, right, in the in Google there. Being a bit lazy, say do that. Boof. It's kind of the same thing as going to ChatGPT, but less less copy paste. So it's writing this code, and um, yeah, let's actually do these things that I was talking about, right? So here's an example. It thinks I want long comments like that. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. If I don't, tell it. Right? So don't just automatically uh, accept everything it gives you. So, okay, let's try this. Boof. This was different, right? There's no main function here. I can't even run this. So uh, um, add a main. 
And now it has my context. It has the context of this file. I don't have to copy paste anymore, right? It, it knows what, what we're looking at. So uh, let's add this bit of main down here, right? It gave me the whole file again, so I'll just copy the whole file. And we'll run it. OK. <laughs> true, true, false. OK, this is a bit boring. I'd like, to, I'd like this to be an app instead, so I can, an interactive app, right? So what do I do? Well, just ask, right? Uh, make uh, an app out of it. OK. Sometimes it gives me the whole file again. Sometimes it gives me just a diff. Again, if you don't like what it's giving you, give it feedback, right? Just like you would with a, with a human programmer. So uh, there we go. It gave me the whole thing again. And uh, let's run it. Enter a Swedish, this is hard to see. There we go. Uh, let's clear this, clear, and run it again. Enter a Swedish personal identity number to validate, blah, blah, blah. OK, we'll write a real, real, real one. Um, let me just make one up here. The number is valid. It's not a very exciting program, but it's still pretty cool, right? How it just kind of like makes it for me like in just a few minutes. It would have taken me a lot longer to do myself. Um, so let's, uh, let's do the unit test thing then, right? So go back here. We go um, um, into the chat again. Add some simple unit tests in a separate file. This is me cheating a little bit. When you've used the tools enough, you kind of know what it's going to do. And I know it's going to add it in the same file. I kind of want it in a, in a different, different file. So you, you learn to kind of preempt some, some issues after a while, right? So test pn.py. Let's uh, make that while it's making the code. Um, and yeah, et cetera. So I, 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 won't, I won't dig through in this example anymore because it's a very simple example, right? But um, I could stick this test in. I could run it. I could ask it to change things in the test or in the code. And I could also do the opposite. I could do a test driven development. Ask it to first make the tests. And then when I'm happy with the tests, I can say, make code that fits this test. Right? It's really kind of up to you. But I want to add one, one, one more example here. Let's, let's uh, leave that unit test for now. Or actually, let's just stick it in here so we have it. But I won't run it. Um, I'm going to ask it to make us a simple little app here. Right? I'm going to say, um, create a utility script. Um, that reads a text file um, and outputs all valid um, person numbers that are in the file. OK. An important thing is, normally, the context it has is the file that I'm currently looking at, right? But if I want, I can give it the whole code base as context. Like I say, just look at all the files that exist in the whole code base. And then it'll look at everything and index it and figure out which code is relevant for this prompt. So this eliminates the, the kind of annoying step with ChatGPT programming where you have to figure out what code do I need to paste from my code base into ChatGPT, right? Because that's really important. If you don't give GPT the context, it's going to give you crap code. Well, I still have to think about the context, but it's a lot easier now, right? So uh, I'll just make, a, I'll just make a, a file called validate, or so actually let's call it um, check file, right? There it is, and it gave me this little thing here. And there it is, uh, read a file, validate, I'll put all, I won't run it, it's boring. What I want to show is an interest in detail, right? Here it's reading a file. And by the way, at this kind of coding, after a while you learn, when you work with this, you learn when to trust the code and when to not. I would trust this code, it's probably going to work. I would say 9 out of 10, right? I'm not 100% sure. But in other cases, I would read the code very carefully. So you kind of learn after a while, when do I need to be really careful, when can I just say, yeah, whatever. So, but let's add a bug. I'm going to open the file. Instead of, read, instead of opening it in read mode, I'm going to open it in write mode. Let's just pretend that GPT screwed up, right? Or let's say I wrote this code and I screwed up, which is a more likely scenario. <laughs> and this is nice, because let's say I run this code. It blew up, right? I don't know what happened. My simple prompt is going to be debug. It looks at the code. It's like, do I see anything weird here? And it's like, oh, let's see. Oh, there's a mistake there. Uh, you open the file in the, It's very polite, right? It doesn't swear at me. You open it in, in write mode, right? It should be in, in read mode. So it kind of all I had to write was debug, and it from the context figures out that here's something you probably didn't want wanted to do based on the name of the function and stuff like that. So check file with open. It gives me the diff here. And now if I'm really lazy, let's pretend this is a big file. I'm not sure which line is that. Which line do I change? Well, apply diff. There's a little button here. Boof. Apply to entire file. Now it is coding. I can go get my cup of tea, and then boof. It's like, that's the change. Do you accept? Yes, I accept. 
So this is kind of like the next level after copy paste of ChatGPT. This thing is integrated in the environment. It feels like a colleague. We're sitting here pair programming. It's, it's quite, quite interesting. All right, um, let's see. Looking at my cheat sheet here. Um, oh yeah, interesting little detail. Let's say I, I want to commit this now, right? I want to I commit this change. There, I made some changes. It'll even auto-generate a suggested commit comment, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's continue. That was a simple demo. All right. Let's do something more realistic. I mean, how often are you adding something new from scratch, right? Usually you're working with existing code. Also, by the way, you might be thinking, why am I writing custom code for validating person number, right? So a natural extension to this might be to ask GPT, is there some package that does this for me? And then you might iterate using that, right? Just keep in mind, like these models know a lot. They don't know everything. So if there's some obscure little package out there that does exactly what you want, maybe it doesn't know about it, right? So, but just keep in mind that if GPT is giving you code that you're like, shouldn't there be a third party thing for this? Remember, it is giving you what it thinks you want. And sometimes just if the code is just this much, why not just give it to you, right? But if you prefer to get, use third-party modules, then just tell it. There's actually a place where you can give it standing instructions here under more, where you say that use third-party packages whenever possible, for example, right? So, and then it'll always apply that. Or use TypeScript or, you know, always write tests or whatever. Right? Okay. So let's, let's do a little more tricky example, one that's a lot more likely to blow up in my face. <laughs> Um, work with this existing code. Now, I have this little hobby project. You can try it if you want. I just made it mostly for fun because I wanted to kind of push the limits of, of AI. So this is a, uh, um, it's, it's called whodoneit.knieberg.com. That's where, this, where it's located. So um, let's see. Opening the slides here. Yeah, whodoneit. Um, you can try it if you want. It's a mystery game. You uh, role play as a detective solving a mystery. Interesting thing is that all these mysteries are auto-generated. You just can generate a new one by typing a theme here or even letting it just invent one. It invents just mysteries that you're supposed to solve as a detective. And then let's say I want to solve mystery of the stolen clock. Everything auto-generated, all the pictures, the newspaper article, um, the story storyline, the characters, the, their personalities, it's all auto-generated. It's crazy. But so let's say I want to play this mystery. I want to figure out what happened here, right? And the backstory was Sir Arthur lost his clock. So tell me about your clock. And now I'm chatting with him. Of course, GPT is powering this little role-playing conversation, right? And uh, I can go in, like a good detective, interrogate the different characters, learn about what happened, um, and uh, maybe ask him about each other, because there's plenty of intrigues between the characters. Um, all right. It's being a bit slow. We'll see if it will give it 10 seconds. There. So there's him. This long blah, blah, blah about his clock. And I might ask, who do you think did it? Um, and he might blame Beatrice, and I might ask her, you know, did you do it? She's like, I didn't do it. And then blah, 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 and I go search the crime scene a little bit. And then at some point, I go and uh, make an accusation. I'm speeding up here by just showing a slide instead. So I make an accusation, I go to the police officer, and I said, I think, uh, you know, blah, blah did it. And then the police officer wasn't convinced in this case. So but if I do this, I, you know, write, I describe it more convincingly. The police officer's like, okay, I believe you. And then you get to the epilogue. In this case, nope. I got the wrong person, I failed. Uh, the heiress, Beatrice Lovelace, got arrested, and she was innocent, and I failed. This is the game loop, right? So generate mysteries automatically, play them, see if you solved it. But this is just for context. What I want to talk about is, let's say we want to edit this code, right? So this code represents somewhat of a legacy code base. It's not a huge code base, but it's not tiny either. It's much too much to fit in a whole prompt, right? Um, so uh, I'm, I have it running locally, I think. Localhost 3000 here, yes. So I want to edit this code, and I'm going to kind of, let's say, you know, as often happens, you're going to go back to some old code base you haven't seen in a while, you're not sure how it works, where do I make a change, right? How many have been there, hand up, a little confused, where do I start, right? It's very common, right? So in this case, let's say the change I want to make is when I publish a mystery here, right? I can, I can, I, I, a mystery that I've made, I want to make it available to the world. I can press publish, and others can see it. Now, that's a bit scary. Maybe, you know, maybe I, I want a confirmation here, right? So let's just pretend that's something I want to change. I'm not really sure how to change it. So let's be super, super, super lazy and just take a screenshot here and say, hey, <laughs> um, let me open up the right project. Who done it? Here it is, right? Uh, we'll close. No, that's the wrong, that's the wrong one. Here it is. Uh, 
Yeah, so it, there's a bunch of code here, right? There's a back end, a front end, it's a Next.js thing, and there's, a bunch, there's some Lambda going on here for performance, just stuff happening, right? So let's say I want to make a change. Before I even make the change, I want to understand the code a little bit, right? So I'm going to ask it, uh, what is this product, right? And I'm going to press with code base. And now it's going to take the whole code base and index the shit out of it. <laughs> and then do all the prompt magic that I could have done with ChatGPT, where it would have taken me 20 minutes of copy pasting, right? And it's like, oh, it's an interactive AI powered murder mystery game, blah, blah. And it describes the gameplay loop and you know, what it actually do and um, use OpenAI. And it just tells me about what this is. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to say, uh, explain uh, the gameplay, right? What's the, what's the player's perspective? And it figures out from the code and some com comments here and there, and um, just this is what a player does. So again, no more go finding some old document that somebody wrote two years ago that's completely out of date. This, is, this documentation is correct because it's generating it right now based on the actual code. Um, and same thing with, with architecture. I can say, uh, explain, uh, summarize the architecture. Um, uh, list the key components, right? My spelling is awful right now, so go, etc. So great way just to learn what, what is this, right? How does it work? The front end, the back end, there's a chakra for styling, blah, 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 right? So we'll stop that and let's actually add a feature. So we go here and I'm like, this thing here, when I press publish, I want a confirmation first, so I don't publish accidentally. This is where, you know, the good old Agile thing, right? Uh, as a blah, I want blah, so that blah, that format, great for this, right? What do you want? Why do you want it? Who wants it, right? So, uh, and now I'm not sure which code I would need to change, so I'm just going to say the whole code base. And this is a key thing. When you give it the whole code base, you give it a wide context. You don't give it a deep context. So it's good at finding where to go, and it'll, for the most part, succeed, but sometimes it'll mess up some details. So if I want it to be, to be really precise, I give it a narrower context, I find the files and give it just those files, right? But now I'm gonna be a bit wild and crazy and just see if it can su succeed just looking at the whole code base. And it did, I think. It said, to add a confirmation, you gotta fiddle in this file here, mystery card. Even this was super useful. Just knowing where do I look. Even if the rest was manual, I'm already happy for this, right? Where do I go? Mystery card is apparently this component here, right? So uh, um, I'm supposed to change that one. What am, I, what am I supposed to do? Update the publish function. Okay. Oh, and it's it right here. So uh, I could say apply diff. It'll just put it in for me. But since it's right in front of me, it's faster to just copy it in. So, you know, that's kind of case by case, right? I paste it in, and uh, hopefully it'll work. Um, and uh, publish. Ta-da! Dude, if, if we don't give GPT some, you know, like encouragement, he'll get tired and he'll just not stop working after a while. So keep them. Now, this is an ugly pop-up, right? So we can imagine a continuation of this story where I say, that's an ugly pop-up, make it prettier, and then blah, blah, blah. So uh, um, I'll give an example of the type of prompts I used when building this game. And I was really surprised. These are some more or less actual prompts that I, that I used when building the game. So uh, I'm planning to make a game about about, you know, just I described what it's about, and please suggest an architecture for it, right? Uh, or this UI is ugly. Make, it looks like a boring corporate website. Make it look more like a game. It did that, made it look prettier. And I learned some things about how to make sites prettier, etc. Like, what are the security holes? Or what are the pros and cons of this framework versus that? Oh shit, it crashed. Fix it, here's a stack trace. Uh, how do I deploy this anyway? The, you know, whatever, right? How, and also the gameplay. How can I make the game more interesting? So basically, everything I did with the game, from the beginning to the end, was uh, in collaboration with GPT. I honestly think the game would have taken probably 10 times longer uh, without that. All right, back to the cheat sheet. Uh, and no longer stop the PowerPoint stuff, please. Boof. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah, let's, let's do something a little trickier now, if we have time. I think we do, yeah, we do, okay. That was still a fairly simple example, right? Let's push our luck a little bit with these demos. <laughs> let's say I want to change the layout of this, right? So let's paste this thing there. And I'm going to first have a bit of a design discussion, right? Let's close this and say, um, uh, what are some alternatives for this uh, layout of, mystery, of, the, of mysteries? Right? So now, now it's my design buddy. It's looking at the picture. 
And it's going to give me some options, I hope, <laughs> um, showing what are some options. It could be a grid hover effect, a carousel, a list view, masonry layout. This is great for getting ideas, right? Uh, so let's say I, I, I looked at that, and I'm like, OK, um, I would like, um, I would like um, to be able to toggle the layout between the current um, grid layout um, with mystery cards and a simple table layout um, where each um, mystery is one row in the table. This is a non-trivial change. It would take a while to figure out how, you know, like, if, like I never used Next.js before, for example. I was new to this framework. Where do I, where do I make the change? It, you know, a bit confusing how to do it. And I don't even know which file to look at, right? So again, take the whole code base and wish for some, some luck. Go fill up the teacup, come back and see what it came up with, right? Um, of course, if you know which file it's supposed to change, you can just, it, you can just tag that file, say it's here. And then it'll be faster and more reliable. So this is a trade-off. But I'm being a bit dumb now and just taking my chances. It works four out of five times, so uh, let's see if we get lucky. Because when it takes the whole code base, it's doing things like embeddings and vector database behind the scenes. So it's doing some summarization. And I honestly kind of don't understand how it even could succeed with anything when it indices the whole code base. But the guys making this product are really smart. They have all kinds of fancy algorithms going on. And they navigate the code base. And they often find out what needs to change. So I got to do this. I got to go to this page here, which is the lobby page, which that sounds reasonable, right? So I'm doing a bit of uh, a sanity check here, right? Lobby page. Well, this feels like a lobby, so okay, sure. I got to add uh, a toggle state here. I got to add the button itself, and then here is the actual. This, this looks reasonable. But I'm way too lazy to find all the places in this code where I need to insert this, right? So now I'm just going to do the apply diff thing. Go. Do your magic. And actually, give me some time to take a drink. This is great. This is AI coding for us. <laughs> All right, so it did that. It's still working because it says cancel here. So it's being a little bit slow now, um, which might give me some time. That's the thing with these models. You know, sometimes they're fast, sometimes they're slow. There is actually a model you can, you can select called GPT like, um, fast or something uh, in Cursor. They made their own model or their own variant, which is super fast. But I learned when preparing for this demo that it's completely unreliable so far. So I guess it's working. It just gave me weird. Crap code like several times, so okay, whatever. Um, but it's here, it's here. You can select it there. You can't see it, but cursor fast, right? Or GPT-4, or no, don't use that one. Never GPT-3.5 for coding. Um, okay, here are the changes. I'm gonna sanity check it, right? It wants to add some dependencies. It wants to um, uh, let's see what else does it want to do. Wait, is that it? Wait, right, let's see. Accept it. It did. It, ah, it failed. We have our first demo fail. Applaud. Woohoo. Yes. It, it would be boring if there was no demo fails, right? It would be absolutely boring, right? What? Oh, yeah, there are more changes in there. Maybe I just told it to make the first one. Ah, thank you, whoever anonymous hero out there. So I want this one too, please. Go. Thing is, sometimes when you press the first one, it does all of them after. In fact, it still says generating up there, actually. It's a little bit confusing. But OK, I will do this. I will skip the part where it does it for me. No, I'll give it one more chance. I'll give you one more chance, sir. And if it doesn't, I'll do it the old way. I'll copy paste the code. And ah, oh, Jesus, life is so difficult. Yeah, we'll do copy paste. So I need to add a button somewhere, right? I'll just stick it in somewhere. Um, which mystery do you want to solve? I'll stick it in under there. Boof. And then we have this conditional rendering is table layout right over there. OK, so we'll stick that in somewhere. There's my other grid, so I'm going to guess it's inside there. So now I have to kind of somewhat understand at least a little bit about the code, right? But yeah, toggle layout. There we go. It's not pretty, but it worked. And it's pretty fast, right? So again, this would have taken me a long time. And now, because it took me a short time, I have more time to think about the design, more time to iterate. I might actually change this code myself. 
afterwards because now I know how to do it, right? It showed me where to put it, roughly how to, so I could fiddle this myself or I could just keep being lazy and keep prompting it, right? So in this case, let's, you know, if we look at this file, we're like, you know what, there's actually a lot of code on here now. This is growing now, right? There's server-side props and we just, we just kind of duct taped in some, some tables here and it's getting a bit messy. And this is a key thing. Code quality is still yours. You, you as a human, as a developer, own code quality. Can't blame you know, the model for giving you bad code. You gotta take responsibility, prompt it, kind of decide what you want. So in this case, I'm gonna say, um, uh, this file is getting a bit messy. Messy and big. Can we extract some components perhaps, right? Or something. So now it's discussion mode, right? Per perhaps, right? It's good that they're not picky about spelling, right? So yeah, there we go. It figured out immediately. Well, you have a mystery table. That's uh, this one. And you have a mystery grid. Oh, sorry, the mystery table is uh, this one, right? And the mystery grid is that one. So it sees a structure here, and it's suggesting a change. And in fact, it even gave me the code. So kind of assume that this is what I'm going to want. So now, I'm not going to do this now because I think this is enough, but just, you know, here I could easily, and I trust this code. This is going to work. Refactoring, it's really good at refactoring because refactoring doesn't require creativity, right? So if I give it the right context and the right instruction, refactoring will usually work. However, simple refactorings, like rename a class that's used in 15 different places, IDE shortcut will be faster and safer. So, you know, they're still there, the IDE shortcuts. Use them whenever possible. But a little more complicated, right? I can't tell the IDE, please find duplicate code here and extract it. That's too vague. So that's when you need a, a model, right? But again, my experience with GPT-4 is that it's generally speaking, will nine out of 10 times get refactoring perfectly right. So I'm not even gonna test this, right? This is two different components that, that are gonna come out. Okay, let's see. Um, I have time for, we go till 16.50, right? Yeah, good. Then I have time for one little additional spin on this. Um, let's say I wanna add a high score list to this, right? You, you completed a mystery and I want a scoring system. So we could discuss that with GPT and say, um, I would like some kind of scoring system. Um, system um, and leaderboard so I can show off to my friends. Um, any idea for how we can calculate this? No code, please. I don't want it to code, I just want, I want to discuss, right? So again, okay, now I didn't give it my code, but it somehow still knows roughly what I'm talking about. It's kind of weird. But normally I would say, look, look at all the code and then uh, discuss different ways, right? Based on how fast you, you finished. Okay, here, it doesn't know what it's talking about. It's making up shit now. That's another thing. You got to learn to spot that, right? I forgot to give it a context and now it's making shit up. So with code base, please. Right? I don't want to talk about score systems in general. I want to talk about scoring systems in this game with this code. So there we go. All right, how long it took to solve a mystery, hints used, accuracy solution. This is great. This is awesome, right? How do we store the score? Maybe in a database, blah, blah, blah. I'll stop there and I'll just say, um, uh, now, this is another thing. This is a pretty big change. It would touch many parts of the system. I could just say, do it. But it's, you know, it's likely to get some things wrong. I'd rather take smaller steps when doing bigger changes. So in this case, I just want to change the domain model first to see if we get it right, okay? But which file is that? How am I going to find out? Well, lazy developer, where is the domain model? Which file? Boof. Find it for me, sir. It digs through the code base and it goes, um, okay, let's see here. It's kind of like I'm sitting next to some guy who wrote all this code, even though it was me, but in the past and I forgot everything. Here's a guy that wrote all the code and remembers everything, right? And, okay, this is something it does. It goes into some other modes sometimes where it tries to be really smart, but it actually gets kind of dumb. So I'm going to skip that and go to another start a new dialogue and say, where is the domain model? Which file, right? Starting a fresh, and that's another thing you kind of learn. When do I need to start a fresh chat? When is my chat polluted, right? These are prompt engineering skills. You, you learn after a while. Um, it's almost intuition, kind of. So, uh, okay, it found it. Um, domain model is in DB schema, is the database schema. Um, and then there's another file, which is going to tell me about in a moment but I'll just save some time and skip that and go to the file I actually wanted, which was this one, right? So this is the domain model, just a bunch of files, right? What, what, what's my data structure? There's characters, there's crime scenes, et cetera. And here I would say, um, I want a scoring system 
uh, based on uh, how long it took to solve a mystery and a leaderboard. Um, please update the domain model. And I'm going to be really specific now. Um, this file is automatically included in the context, but, uh, but you can also tag files. And I'm going to say I actually want really to zoom in on this file. I don't want to change anything else, right? Only update this file. Because if it's going to get this wrong, I don't want to have to have 15 different changes. I want to just see that it gets the domain model right. But that's another trade-off, right? Make lots of changes or make one change? So uh, now it's going to propose an updated domain model that takes into account scoring, right? So we have a character, crime scene, mystery. Let's see if we get to the goody bits soon. Um, this is the same code as before, I think. Um, Oh, it was up. What is up there? Crime scene, mystery stub. Where is the score? Does someone see a score somewhere? Search body. Did I miss it? Ah, it's it's in there somewhere probably. Let's look for a score. Or a leaderboard. Ah, never mind. This one failed. Screw this one. <laughs> But anyway, this is a useful technique, right? So uh, I, I want to make this change. Just make it here locally. Iterate on it, right? Um, write some code yourself. And then when I'm happy with it, I could say, this is great. Now fix it everywhere, because now I trust the design. Look at this domain model, update the database, the UI, or whatever, right? So very powerful stuff. Right. Yeah, it, I think probably my prompt. Yeah, up, ah, domain, oh, the domain file, right? Yeah, good point. So that's, that's probably why. This, thanks for that learning point. This is another thing. Nine out of ten times when it fails, when I really look closely, it's almost always my prompt or my context. It's really interesting. It's a humbling experience. Where you're like, ha dumb model. No, the dumbness is here. <laughs> okay. I'll do a final example, which we'll barely have time for, um, which is uh, going back to Python again. Um, APIs. What about interacting with APIs, right? That's something we do all the time. This is where the models are not super great, um, but uh, let's, uh, let's just try, right? So let's say I want to I read uh, Twitter. I want to interact with Twitter. So just for in case, I'm going to say, uh, do you know the Twitter API? Just for in case, right? This is an empty project now, right? Yeah, I feel like you're OK. So it claims to know about the Twitter API. Great. Fine. We can skip that and say, OK, uh, write a Python uh, script that uh, checks the latest tweet. Latest uh, tweet from a given public uh, uh, handle, right? Twitter, Twitter handle. Okay. Boof. So now I'm relying on GPT's understanding of the Twitter API, right? That works for well-known APIs and for APIs that aren't changing like all the time. Newer APIs, it's going to probably fail, right? But it can still be useful. Even a, a broken implementation will give you a high-level high idea of how to do it. Um, but I'll talk more about APIs in a moment, right? So here it's suggesting I use a third-party package. So uh, I'll do that, right? Terminal, terminal. Um. Oh, oh, it got that still? Okay, whatever. Um. Okay, and yeah, here we have uh, a little bit of code, and we'll stick it in. And, oh, not there. Inside my, i got to make a file. Okay. Uh, Tweet.py. Okay. Uh, looking at that, hide the terminal and hide this. It's not a lot of code. I can immediately see that it's trying to load some kind of token that I need, right? And, of course, I prepared a token in advance because that's just boring going, clicking around on the web. But I have an, an environment file here with some environment variables, right? So I'm going to say use that. Uh, use the end file. So it's a shortcut inside this tool where you go basically edit, right? And now it's kind of like GitHub Copilot immediately inside the code. So I'll just go, uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, use my end. And it just updates my code in place, which is really cool. So accept. There we go. And uh, which Twitter handle do I want to check? Uh, why not my own, right? Mm. And we go. Uh, that's, why is it running that one? That's, that's not even the right program. That's my old one. There we go. Run this one, please. There. OK. And now it's like something went wrong. And this is pretty common with APIs, right? Something goes wrong. 
uh, it, maybe the API changed or something, right? So I have some options here. I can go look up the actual docs for how to do it. Or I can be a little bit lazy and optimistic and just say debug with AI or maybe add the chat and say uh, fix this. You can hope, right? So uh, the ID parameter is not valid because Twitter ex API expects an, a user ID, not a username. It would have taken me a while to figure that out, right? So, uh, and it's suggesting a modification where it looks up the ID of the user. Again, this might work 50% of the time, but it's worth it, right, for those 50% of the times. Because if it didn't work, then I'll just do it the old way and look up the docs, right, or, or find some, you know, just Google it, right? So let's do get latest tweet, um, and we go like that. And we run it. You can't barely see it. But there it is. I think I tweeted. Hello, J Focus. Yeah. Hello, J Focus. It got it. Yeah. OK. So uh, if I had more time, I might tinker with this. I might teach it the, the OpenAI API and the Trello API and the Slack API. I just give it all that, right? Some will succeed, some will fail. And then I could tell it, make a UI for a really cool app where you monitor the latest five tweets in this account, and then you put it on a Trello board or send a message on Slack or summarize it using GPT. You can tie these things together in an incredible way. But now I'm finished with coding demos, and let's do a bit of reflection here, right? So, um, yeah. APIs. When it fails, you have some options, right? Maybe, uh, maybe I should use the Twitter API directly. Maybe I shouldn't use this third-party library. Maybe GPT doesn't know it. Generally speaking, GPT knows the core library is better than the packages. So, tw so the Twitter API is well-documented, right? GPT knows that one better. So if I kept running into problems, I would probably say, ditch that third-party package, just use the raw REST API. It would succeed better with roughly the same amount of code. So the value of intermediary packages is a bit lower now that you have these models because they know the raw APIs and they have one less source of errors. Just interesting detail. But yeah, what happens when something goes wrong? Right? Sometimes it just failed. So here's your debugging guide, right? This could be a reason. You're using a shitty model. So solution, don't, right? Um, another could be the AI is clumsy, but it's not. If it is, you're using a shitty model, <laughs> generally speaking. It's not, I, I almost never find accidental mistakes nowadays with models like GPT-4. Um, so you, you may be using a shitty model or your, or, your, or your prompt is bad. So most likely cause. Sometimes it'll make clumsy mistakes, but very rarely. At least I make a lot more clumsy mistakes <laughs> than it will. Um, the prompt was bad. Okay, fix the prompt. This is the most likely cause. In fact, you saw some examples now during this talk even, right? Um, or I didn't provide the necessary context. My prompt was great, but I didn't give it the information it needed. So it starts trying to guess, right? It does whatever it can, just like a junior program or an intern would have done also, right? Um, so provide the context. Um, it could be this one. This is a very common one. You're using an API or framework that isn't very well known, right? This is where the value of these models is a bit weaker. It can still be helpful, but only sometimes, right? So your options are switch to a more well-known alternative. Maybe I shouldn't use this very niche web framework. Maybe I should just use React, because then G GPT can write all my code for me flawlessly. But if I use this niche framework, I'm going to do a lot more manual coding. So it's a trade-off, right? Um, or I give the docs. There are ways, I won't have time to show it, but there are ways inside this IDE cursor where you can basically send the link and say, learn this doc. And it reads the reference, indexes it, and now it knows that better. It's not perfect. It's kind of hit and miss, but it's still quite powerful. My favorite one is probably, um, probably uh, I didn't write it here, but g give it an example, right? Let's say I want to use OpenAI API. I would go to the web page with the reference documentation. I would copy paste hello world, because there's always a hello world in the documentation. And I'll tell GPT, here's how it works. And it's like, oh, okay, now build this app for me, <laughs> right? So the one bit that it really sucked at, I gave it that code, and then it figured out the rest. That's a typical pattern. Another thing is you're using a very fresh version of an API. This is why no models, the models I've tried, are not, they are not good at coding against the OpenAI API, for example, which is ironic, right? Because it's changing very fast. So your options are use an older version, which is sometimes preferable, um, or just uh, write that piece of code yourself. So again, 
So yeah, um, here uh, it's uh, using APIs. It's a little bit of a weaker point, but still valuable if you learn these, these kind of tricks. So in general, if things aren't working, take smaller steps. Instead of saying, build this whole app for me, you might slow it down and just say, hey, can you just read the latest tweet from this person? Just get that to work. OK, great. Now that we have that working, let's do something bigger, right? This is kind of similar to the way you just program as a human as well, right? If you get bogged down, you, you need to take smaller steps. All right. Um, I think we're running out of time, but uh, I'm just going to double check. Yeah. Cool, four minutes. Wrap up. So uh, how long would all this coding have taken without AI assistance, what I just did now? I spent about maybe 30 minutes coding. It would have taken hours, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. The time saving is quite immense if you learn to these techniques. So um, developer productivity. Um, traditional coding, it's like you spend some time understanding the problem, you spend a ton of time coding. We like to forget how much time we spend wrestling with code. But we spend a lot of time wrestling with code. When you code with ChatGPT4, for example, and copy-paste code, that old way, right? Just copy-paste back and forth. Understand the problem. Transport code back and forth. Copy-paste. Feels stupid, but it's work you got to do. But the reward is this, right? You spend a lot less time coding. The net effect is positive if you know prompt engineering. And then, you know, uh, modern tools like, like uh, Cursor, understanding the problem. You can even spend more time on that, right? You have time to really think about the problem, which is good. And then transporting code is almost nothing, as you saw. It's really tiny. And then uh, it tends to make even better code because it has your context. So you spend even less time. You still need to wrestle with code sometimes, but a lot less than usual. So, and as, as I mentioned, quality is still your responsibility. You can't blame it, right? AI can cause your mess or it can fix your mess. Um, and quality tends to be sticky. If your code is in a structure in a certain way, the AI models tend to try to mimic that. So try to keep your code clean, and it will keep it clean as well. Um, just, just a general tip, right? So developer productivity, this is totally, you know, I have no research back in this. This is just my own personal, personal experience working alone and with teams. Is that, you know, coding without internet sucks. That's really slow, right? It's good to have internet. Coding with Google searches, you get a lot more productive. Coding with GPT, pasting back and forth. If you're new at prompt engineering, it's still better than not doing it. But if you're good at it, then it gets radical, right? And the next step is coding with AI native IDE it makes even this feel really slow and ineffective. And then, of course, what's next? I have no idea, right? So um, what is the role, then, of humans in this, right? Well, I don't think AI is going to take over development entirely for quite a while. Um, I'm still needed as a developer. I've got to decide what, what is the context, what I want to achieve. Uh, I've got to evaluate the results. I've got to compensate for weaknesses. I've got to spot hallucinations. There's all this stuff I have to do as a human as well. So I think of it kind of like, you know, you're really slow. You're a human. You make mistakes and, and things take forever. AI has its problems, right? Put them together, you can compensate for each other's weaknesses. Very powerful. And I hope what I showed now is, illustrates that. So this is a tweet from Kent Beck, the guy who invented extreme programming, which really got to me. I think he really captured it. He said, I've been reluctant to try ChatGPT. Today, and this was like half a year ago or something, today I got over that reluctance. Now I understand why, why I was reluctant. The value of 90% of my skills just dropped to zero. But the leverage for the remaining 10% went up 1,000 times. And I think that really captures it. We need, to, we need to recalibrate. So that's really what it is all about. I think wh whatever your role is, developer or other, think about what you spend time on, right? Where do you add value? And uh, th think about what things should I continue doing? What things can AI help me with? And what things can AI do instead of me? And with that time, what can I do that I didn't have time to do before, which is nice? And what are some things I used to do that nobody needs to do anymore, for example? So wrap up, final slide, key points, things I hope you'll remember after this coding frenzy. Um, carrot and a stick, they're both there, right? The carrot is you can get insanely productive if you really learn to use these tools. The stick is <laughs> developers who don't know how to work, with, work effectively with gen, gen, gen AI I think will be unemployable fairly soon. Biggest limitation is you, as I mentioned. Prompt engineering is a new skill. It's a weird skill. You've got to experiment, practice, and learn. The nice thing is it'll also make you better at communicating in general, because it's kind of related. So that's kind of nice. Um, recalibrate how you spend your time. I like how Kent phrased that. So uh, I hope this talk uh, helped you move a little bit towards more towards the middle, regardless of where you were before. So thank you very much. <laughs>